Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'll turn the meeting over to Mr. David Lamb. Thank you, Judy. And I want to welcome everybody to the last or, uh, webinar in the Organic Production System Series for uh, 2011. And I think you're in for a real treat with today's presenter, uh, uh, Rex Dufour, who is with the in, uh, NCAT and he works out of California. And he's been with them since 1994, and he's been working in the organic, ecological, and sustainable agricultural arena since then. And uh, just been having a really good discussion with Rex. Found out he was a member of the uh, soil quality uh, teaching cadre there several years ago. So we've been having some good discussion on that. But before we get into Rex's presentation, I want to go through a few, uh, a few slides here and just kind of remind folks how things work. Um, this course, the two things, this uh, webinar, like all the webinars we sponsor here out of the Tech Center, are, are recorded and will be available for replay at a future date. And I'll show you where that link is uh, when, after Rex is done. Uh, you can also get certified crop advisor credits, continuing education uh, unit credits. Uh, what you need to do is download uh, the uh, form, uh, to print your name, give us your certification number, and sign it and send that back to Dr. Holly Kirkendall via email or fax. And again, I'll present that at the end of the presentation and uh, for you to get that. And also, when you go in there, you'll be able to see some uh, handouts that, that Rex has provided for us for your uh, use as related to organic production and uh, agriculture. Uh, the first one is just a general, it's a two-page, and it just shows some really good sources of information uh, for organic information for production and research. Uh, it's got websites, phone numbers, addresses, that kind of thing. Uh, you can download that there. Then uh, the second handout he's provided is specific information for organic pest management resources uh, where he can go to get uh, publications and uh, that type of thing that he'll get into here in a little bit. So those, uh, and then the final uh, available publication, and this is an excellent one. I've referred to it several times. Actually, a couple of the, uh, and I hate to use the word CSP enhancements, because uh, I know some folks out there don't think that's a four-letter word. But several of the CSP enhancements were based uh, on some of the principles that Rex uh, advocates in the farming or farmscaping to enhance biological control. So you can't fault the technology because of the program, but the, this is a very good pu uh, publication. A lot of the planning principles that NRCS advocates, Rex captures here and, and makes them very, very clear to, and helps you understand those. Uh, and then lastly, before Rex takes over, what I want to do is there's two ways to ask questions. As the operator said earlier, we'll, we take questions at the end. You hit star one uh, and you'll give your name. And, and, and when you're, uh, she calls you up, you'll be able to give a, ask a question uh, over the phone. Or the other way is through the Q&A link on the top of, the, uh, of your webinar page there. You uh, just hit that, and you can type in a question. Generally, we held these to the end, but Rex has agreed to make this a more interactive uh, webinar. If you got some questions, I'll interrupt him periodically throughout his presentation, and he will uh, try and address those as he goes along. So if you have a question, go ahead and type it in, and I'll try and monitor those, and we'll let uh, let Rex take care of those at the time there. So, and um, anyway, in fact, we got a question right now from somebody named Tammy. It says I can't hear or see anything. Did the meeting start? Apparently, she's not logged on to something. Uh, we'll have to follow up with that. So anyway, that being said, I'm going to switch the slides over to Rex. And as soon as they come up here, Rex, I'll let you take it away. Okay, no, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, right. Rex. Thank you. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you today about uh, organic pest management. Uh, I hope that I'll be able to convey some new information to you, and hopefully it'll be interesting as well. And since this is a national audience with, I'm sure, a variety of pest management challenges unique to each 
each region across the country. It's my hope that I can explain why these practices work, uh, and then you'll be able to figure out how you can best implement them in your region. So uh, the idea is kind of presenting the basic principles behind the practice, and then uh, you'll have to figure out the details in your own region because uh, there's, a, there's a lot. The regions differ quite, quite dramatically across the country. So this is essentially what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm sure I'm going to miss some areas and topics. Um, for example, I could probably spend all day just on the importance of soil management to pest management. Um, but I hope I'll, I'll get most of the important points. Um, as David said, uh, you can type in questions, I think, and he'll interrupt me during the talk uh, with your questions. Otherwise, hold them to the end. Um, the boilerplate part, uh, I'm just going to be touching on some very basic organic rules with respect to pest management. I'm not going to be talking a lot uh, about regulations or the organic system plan so much as just practices that can be used within organics. Um, on the silver bullet and many little hammers um, bullet, I am just referring to the one tool paradigm for example, um, using Roundup as your only source of weed management versus uh, something like the many smaller checks and balances, which are characteristic of ecological approaches to pest management. So I'll be talking about that a little bit and then uh, go on to some specific practices that can be used for managing weeds, insects, and diseases, and then a very brief thing about resources. So I'm at a slight disadvantage here. I'm not sure what everybody's background is, but I just wanted to make sure everybody uh, understood what the definition of organic production is. And this, it's a system of practices with the emphasis on system. Um, organics is really based on natural processes. It was developed uh, in, in hopeful uh, mimicking of organic pro processes because these um, are, are of, of natural processes, because these processes tend to conserve our resources. If you look at a forest or the Great Plains, you know there's no need for additional um, fertilizer or pest management because the natural processes seem to be taking care of that. So it, it's a good way in trying to mimic natural systems to conserve what I call the swap A resources. That means that's NRCSEs um, for soil, water, air, plant, animal, as well as energy and human resources, and that's a great way to conserve them. So the official transition time for land is three years. However, it will likely take a, a, a fair amount longer to get the farm's soil ecology um, and it's above ground ecology kind of up to snuff once organic practices have begun. And what I'll be talking about today is about some of the ways that perhaps you can speed up the transition to an ecologically based pest management system. Excuse me. So I'll be focusing on general approaches to pest management in organic production systems. Um, most of the practices I'll be talking about are based on the idea of prevention and then facilitating the ecology of the farm to help manage the pest population. So this slide, um, I could be talking about conventional integrated pest management, and um, this slide would be quite appropriate. Um, this is kind of uh, gospel in integrated pest management, the sanitation, crop health, resistant varieties, crop rotation especially, um, correct pest IDs. These are all important components of any kind of IPM, but in organic pest management, uh, the growers are especially dependent on uh, prevention because one synthetic chemical pesticides are prohibited and those pesticides which are available to growers uh, are pretty pricey to be frank so um, just keep in mind uh, there are 
are a few differences between regular IPM and conventional uh, or organic IPM, and one of the main ones is the lack of tools or the need to use ecological principles and approaches to manage um, your pests. And so mechanical techniques can be integrated uh, with these ecological techniques, and that's really what organics is about. The, um, the use of chemicals is definitely a last resort. And, uh, and here are some of the, the basic um, rule in organics is most natural products are allowed. There are some exceptions to that. Most synthetic products are generally prohibited, and this list shows some general exceptions to that rule as well. But I'm not going to be focusing very much on uh, materials because that's, uh, that's not really the ecological approach to pest management. However, here are some resources that you can use. The OMRI is a good uh, location where you can access uh, more detailed information about what is allowed uh, materials that are allowed, and the Washington State Department of Agriculture also has uh, some good information in that re regard. But it's always a good idea to consult the certifier before you use a product, uh, because if an organic grower uses a product that is prohibited, uh, it can be decertified, so that's a real problem. But I'd like to spend a, a, just a little bit of time talking about how, just providing an example of how organic Pest control often works, and this is, um, I heard uh, Dr. David Orr, uh, he's a researcher, he's an entomological researcher at North Carolina State University. Uh, years ago, he was a researcher up in Michigan, he was researching uh, onion maggots uh, and onion maggot management in Michigan, and uh, one of the problems he had was that his colony of onion maggots would die out occasionally, which would create havoc with his research. One of his graduate students had suggested that they switch to organic onions, which he did, and uh, that took care of the colony dying problem. But then it raised the question in his mind, how did this fellow grow onions organically when most of the onion growers he talked to said you can't grow onions without pesticides in Michigan? So he went to uh, the farm, and this is a, just a very simple schematic of one part of that farm. And he started doing some research on that farm to find out what was going on. One of the things he found was, as you can see on the right-hand column, um, the second picture down, uh, one of the things he found was a small wasp that was parasitizing the onion maggot larvae. Um, but during the off-season, the, this particular wasp would parasitize the larvae in the cow patties, the still fly larvae in the cow patties. Um, and that's kind of one, one component of pest control. It certainly didn't provide complete pest control at all, but it was one component, one of the many little hammers that are involved with um, organic pest management. In the weedy areas, they were surveying the weedy areas. They found um, quite a few of these adult flies. In the next picture down, you can see um, some ad an adult fly that had been parasitized by a Bavaria bassiana type of fungus. Uh, another little hammer, not complete control, but just a partial dent in the population. Um, they also noticed uh, the bottom right picture, that's a robber fly, and uh, that's a predator fly. Uh, it's not commonly found in agricultural areas, although you may find them, they're called uh, bearded flies, they're in the acylid fly family, uh, but they found a pretty good population of those, and those were also preying on the adult flies as well. So, And these and other um, organisms were taking care of the onion maggot population, but the interesting thing about the acylid fly or the robber fly is that in this instance, the larvae of the robber fly is an earthworm parasite, and unless you have a good population of earthworms, you're not going to have many robber flies around. So the, his, uh, this fellow, the farmer's soil management practices directly impacted his pest management practices. And I think uh, that's kind of one thing to keep in mind throughout this talk is, and, and I'll focus quite a bit on soil, but um, 
if you manage your soils well, it impacts all the other resources, including uh, the pest management resources. Of course, all the soil scientists on this call know that already. So basically, the starting point for organic pest management is understanding good soil management practices and how they impact various aspects of pest management. It's important um, to manage the above ground ecology as well uh, to provide resources for the beneficial organisms. But if your soil is in poor shape, it will not function to support plant health, and then your pest management becomes all that more difficult. So the first step is really uh, getting your soils in shape, and that's what I'm going to spend the next uh, few slides talking about. One of the biggest resource concerns on an organic farm is really soil quality. And if your soil quality is good, your nutrient management cycle is going to be working well. But um, a lot of times, conventional growers transitioning to organic production oftentimes are not aware of how important soil function is. And so that's a role that NRCS can help them better understand. Matter of fact, soil function, its impacts on nutrient management, pest management, water management, uh, that all impacts pest management. Plus, um, the organic rule requires that uh, growers maintain or improve the condition of the soil. And then uh, that's another aspect where NRCS staff can help the growers monitor their soil uh, to make sure it's actually going in the right direction. And one of the main components of a well-functioning soil is the organic matter. This is a pretty large compost, composting operation, um, lots of organic matter there. And the reason organic matter is important, um, you can see on this schematic, it's the same schematic kind of represented in two different ways. Uh, even though it's a very small percentage of the actual mass of the soil, it really is an important component of the space and location where air and water can reside in the soil. Um, because it's so much less dense than the mineral component, um, mass-wise it's very light, but it has a disproportionate influence over the pore space available for water and air. And it's the organic matter that is really the matrix in which the fungi, the bacteria, and, and the, you know, thousands of other microorganisms live. They then create the substances that allow the soil to aggregate. Soil aggregation is uh, a really important component of pest management, and I'll explain why. If you have good aggregation, it provides for good infiltration of water into the root zone, so the plants will be less water stressed. But the organic matter itself also increases the soil moisture holding capacity of the soil. So again, the um, soils with good organic matter will have more moisture in them, uh, and the organic matter acts really as a sponge. In addition, the soil aggregates resist the formation of soil crust. Now, soil crust creates all kinds of problems. Um, it reduces water infiltration, uh, and less water infiltration ends up uh, reducing the amount of water in the root zone. At the same time, it increases runoff, which creates, you know, that's a whole other problem. I could talk about that for a long time, but I won't. Um, it reduces, but also the soil crusting reduces the air exchange between the atmosphere and the root zone. And so you end up getting these anaerobic conditions. It stresses the roots. It reduces the root function. It creates uh, opportunities for plant disease and uh, really impacts uh, plant health, not to mention it also creates conditions for um, blow off of a lot of greenhouse gases. You're, you're actually, the anaerobic conditions are metabolizing the nitrogen that the farmer has paid for into potent greenhouse gases. That's another story, though. 
hard pans are kind of similar um, in that, you know, over the years, uh, a farm may have developed a plow pan, you know, six, eight inches, maybe 12 inches down. That works to reduce drainage, and then it increases plant stress and disease potential in those areas. So that's another thing the NRCS staff can do is to help make sure the growers you work with check their soils for plow pans and make sure they understand uh, how that impacts their pest management. So it's really not rocket science. The basic strategy in organic pest management is to maintain the soil food web and thereby maintaining the soil function through regular additions of organic matter. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do this, compost, cover crops, green manures, um, but also one other thing to keep in mind is to keep disturbance, either physical or chemical, to a minimum. And remember, crop rotation does wonderful things to break pest cycles. So, easier said than done. So, this is um, kind of gospel to NRCS folks, um, especially the cover cropping. But keep in mind, transitional growers uh, may have soil quality issues as well as, as a, a, uh, a lack of knowledge about good soil management. Uh, when I talk to a lot of transitional growers, I generally recommend heavy applications of organic matter in the form of compost because that way, that's probably the fastest way to get their soils in shape uh, more quickly than most other practices. Cover cropping is another great way, but um, a lot of farmers have problems with cover crops just because it doesn't fit into their 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 system, how they do things. But one thing to keep in mind is that when a when a soil is covered by a plant, you know the plants add organic matter through their biomass, but also through root exudates, and up to a fifth of all the photosynthates developed by a plant are exuded into the soil, and a lot of that supports the soil microbiology. That has a huge effect on uh, pest management. And by rotating crops, you get different chemicals exuded into the soil. It, it diversifies the soil microbiology. So I'll talk a little bit more about cover crops as weed management strategies, as well as beneficial habitat. But just um, some of the recent science developed under, you know, looking at plant-root interactions, the systemic acquired resistance and the induced systemic resistance, those plant-root interactions with the soil microbiology actually changes the chemistry of the above-ground portion of the plant so that it can resist foliar pathogens and, uh, uh, much better than otherwise would happen. And then... And that works much better in well-managed soils than it does in poorly managed soils. And there's some evidence that there's even some resistance to insect attack as a result of some of these interactions. So um, that's all information to keep in mind when you're talking to growers about soil. So NRCS folks understand that cover cropping is, is kind of a, one of the original practices that was uh, introduced back in the 30s. But it can also be an effective weed man management strategy because the cover crop itself can outcompete other plants that grow during that time of year, and so it can knock back the weed population in the um, in the system. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that organic growers should use a higher cover crop seeding rate, and this is in order to get a faster canopy cover developed. And at the same time, organic seed costs more than conventional seed. So um, one of the things I suggest to my folks out here in California that uh, there should be really a significant cost share um, given, like a higher cost share provided to organic growers if they're using cover crops because it does it's going to cost them it's a double whammy you know the higher seeding rate plus the higher seed cost but the cover crops themselves actually uh, present kind of a problem opportunity situation
situation. Conventional growers can use herbicides to kill the cover crop. Organic growers don't have that option. They, they can either mow, they can till, they can graze, or they can use roller crimpers. I'll talk about roller crimpers in a little bit. But combining mow, mowing with no-till or light tillage uh, is one option. Uh, this farmer here in the left side, he's, he's mowing the beds, and then on the right-hand picture, there's uh, the resulting mulch. Uh, it's about two or three inches deep. Um, that's immediately afterwards. That's probably not enough to provide a good weed-suppressive mulch, and this particular grower, he, he'll go back through and use a light cultivate uh, with a Lilliston cultivator just in the top two or three inches just to incorporate that. Uh, but depending on the depth of the mulch, it can provide um, a weed suppressive mulch and delay weed emergence in, in some perennial systems. Some folks will do uh, what's called a mow and blow system where an alley crop is mowed and then they they blow the, the residue of the alley crop into the row underneath the vine or underneath the tree, and that will provide a pretty thick mulch of, um, of residue that can suppress weeds. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, if that residue is up against the plant, uh, the, the tree base or the vine base, uh, it can provide habitat for mice or rodents that can girdle the tree. So. As with many organic practices, there's always a cost-benefit equation to be considered. Making organic mulches, here's some pictures of, of uh, these things called roller crimpers. I'm not sure how acquainted everybody is with this. Uh, it's, it's relatively new, but uh, Rodale has been doing a lot of research on this. But it, what this, the roller crimpers allow um, organic growers to manage cover crops without chemicals. They they roll them, and the, the crimping crimps the stem, so uh, it essentially kills kills the plant. The mulch that is left behind by this kind of um, practice is excellent habitat for spiders as well as ground beetles. Now, when I was in school, spiders were not even considered a significant component of agricultural systems because they don't have a hard exoskeleton like insects. Uh, that makes them more sensitive to extremes of heat and moisture as well as to pesticides. But they are, um, particularly in organic systems, they are very important. I'll cycle back to spiders in, in just a bit, but I want to talk a little bit more about mulch options. So paper mulch, this, this, um, these pictures show Paper mulch being used um, in, in an almond orchard it can be used in any kind of perennial or even annual situation. It's relatively inexpensive. It's uh, biodegradable. Uh, it will last for maybe a season or two, depending on how thick it is, but it's, it's a pretty good way to manage weeds. Timing of the application of the paper is, is critical because you need to get it on before the weeds are germinated. Also, uh, if the paper is not thick enough to block sunlight, uh, you're going to have some problems. I came back to this site a couple weeks later, and, and this woman uh, said she's going to use a double or maybe a triple layer the following year because clearly the, the paper wasn't thick enough. It was lifting up. It was being lifted up by the weeds. Um, but it it can be used as it's, it's easy to use, you know, you have to, on the picture on right, you know, you have to, you know, um, put some dirt on it, there is some labor involved, but it's biodegradable, and it can be used on, on um, annual vegetable beds as well. So just something to keep in mind, and, and RCS has caution. Other type of mulch, we may cloth or plastic mulch, uh, they can be actually quite effective. They last longer. Um, and they can be used under perennial crops or embedded high-value uh, vegetable crops or fruit crops. Uh, some organic growers dislike the use of these kinds of mulches because there are disposal problems. Uh, another cost-benefit on the wildlife side is that it prevents ground-nesting native bees from using this particular area as a habitat um, because the ground is, is essentially not available to them. So. 
again, uh, with many of these practices, uh, there's there's some advantages and disadvantages, and it's just up to the grower what what the grower's goals are. So back to mulches as spider habitat. Um, let me just I I don't know how how much you folks can see, but I'll I'll tell you what you should be seeing in this slide here. Um, this is bare ground, but when I took this picture, it was literally covered with spider silk strands. I mean, it was, you can kind of see that as you look up um, towards the middle of the picture and get a, a little feeling of that. The lower left picture shows a, uh, a piece of silk. Spiders um, have a lot of interesting attributes that uh, are very appropriate to help out in, in any kind of ag system. They're usually the first ones to colonize an area because uh, they do this practice called ballooning or parachuting. You know, they'll c climb to the top of a plant and start exuding a silk strand and that the wind will pick them up and bring them to another area. And that's what happened in this situation. This bare field is literally covered with those silk strands, but the bare ground is very poor spider habitat. Uh, because it doesn't provide much protection from the elements and it doesn't really provide a lot of prey. But um, the Carol O'Meara of uh, Colorado State showed that if you have a very complex um, landscape as far as the diversity of herbaceous or woody plants, you can really support a very good spider population. Chinese have um, augmented their spider populations in their agriculture for centuries. Uh, they used to take bundles of sticks out to the field, uh, wait for spiders to inhabit them, and then uh, bring them back into their agricultural crops. Uh, a study in Germany found that mulch increased spider densities in wheat fields, thereby reducing the um, cereal aphid population by 25%. And, you know, most folks don't generally think of spiders as aphid predators. One interesting aspect of spider, the spiders in an ecosystem is that they can actually change insect pest behavior. Um, it, this is called spider-caused abandonment. Uh, so things like cucumber beetles, Japanese beetles, uh, various Lepidoptera larvae, you know, moths and butterfly larvae, cutworms, green bugs, leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, if they land on a plant and they detect a spider on that plant, they will abandon the plant. And so the spiders can actually protect your plants from predation if you have a good population. Um, they often kill more insects than they consume. Spider diversity, when you think about the different predator guilds in spiders, you know, there's the ground nesting, you know, wolf spiders, there's the jumping spiders that can be on plants or on the ground, orb, re orb and web weavers, there's the ambush spiders, the crab spiders that wait on flowers. So if you have a diversity of kind of habitats in your agricultural system, you will have a diversity of these generalist predators. So enough about spiders. I will switch topics to grazing and weed management. It used to be just about all farms had animals integrated into their operations, and we've become very specialized these days. Uh, that is no longer the case. But uh, chickens, goats, uh, sheep, cattle, pigs, they can all be integrated into a cropping system, and they can provide services such as weed control, insect pest control, they cycle nutrients, they can provide fuel savings, not to mention uh, developing, you know, it's another product that the, that the farmer has to sell. Chickens especially, I think, because they're small and, and kind of easily manipulated, uh, they can be moved relatively easy and they can and provide important pest management services. Many insects pupate in the top couple inches of the soil, and that's where chickens search for food. The picture on the right shows um, the meat chicken enclosures that are moved through a stone fruit, fruit orchard. Uh, it's, uh, these 
are being used in, in Chaffin family orchards uh, in Northern California. They provide pest control and free fertilizer. This particular grower claims that integrating animals into his operation has decreased his fuel use by 85% compared to 10 years ago. Um, these folks, and it's not a small operation either, they have a couple hundred acres of orchards of various kinds. Uh, they don't spend a dime on nitrogen. Uh, they claim that their disease problems in their fruit have decreased dramatically. They've also documented an increase in the bricks of the fruit. Um, that's the, the sugar solids in the fruit. Now the picture on the left shows goats being used in, a, in an olive orchard that's being uh, rehabilitated. It had been taken over by uh, Himalayan blackberry, pretty noxious weed out here in, across the country. Uh, and also they help take care of some of the suckers that are coming up off the base of the olive trees. And so goats are being browsers. Uh, and this is actually part of an NRCS cost share effort here, these goats. Uh, they're really good at controlling noxious weeds, and particularly in riparian areas, so something to keep in mind. So here's a, you know, weeds can, uh, they can manage weeds. They can turn that problem into a possible product. and that can provide a profit. On the left here, uh, these short-legged sheep, they're called baby doll sheep. They're uh, increasingly being used on, on rolling terrain uh, in California. It's kind of mobile weed management. Uh, they're, this is in an avocado orchard. They're um, being used quite a bit in vineyards as well. And the reason the short legs, uh, they they graze the grass, but they won't graze the vines because they're too short. On the right, uh, there's some what I call regular sheep. Uh, that's they're accessing a resource. You know, this early season grass in this orchard uh, wouldn't normally be utilized for much other than just you know as a cover. Um, but so other growers have taken this these kinds of interactions and uh, they use the chickens or small ruminants to clean up their vegetable beds after harvest. It can save, you know, integrating animals can save on labor. It can add fertility to the soil. Um, but, and that's a pretty big but, uh, or large if, I guess, it's important to know <laughs> the grazing habits of your animals. What do the chickens do? How long can you leave a pasture, you know, um, pasture chicken cage in one place? How long can you leave goats in an orchard before they start climbing trees? What kind of fencing uh, do you need? Generally, heritage breeds are often calmer. Um, they generally have a better pasture feed conversion, but the grower needs to understand what are the strengths, the weaknesses, the limitations of the breeds and the species you're working with. Right? the potential, you know, what they'll eat, what they won't. And the left picture here, you can see the sheep have gone through. They've eaten a lot of things, but they don't like bell beans. That's what's left standing in some of the taller grasses in the row, in this orchard row. Um, on the right-hand picture, I, I took that picture because, you know, there's manure on the ground there. Now, manures add a lot of good biology and nutrients to the soil, but uh, especially more recently, you can, there's been a lot of food safety concerns with uh, integrating or even having any kind of animals associated in any way with food crops. So make sure there's plenty of time between animal grazing and crop harvest. Organic rules state that uh, there has to be a minimum of 120 days between application of manure and harvest of crops that might come into contact with the ground. For tree fruits, it's, uh, that harvest interval is 90 days. Um, there's a certifier out here, it's a large certifier, has made the interpretation that manure from grazing animals is not technically considered a manure application. However, there's a lot of growers out here that are pretty spooked by some of the uh, food safety uh, regulations coming down, and so they're being very conservative, conservative on, in their use of, of animals in their pastures or in their crops. So um, I'll just leave it at that, but again, integrating animals into your, your system, it's an art. 
uh, there's a lot of things to learn or relearn uh, that probably older farmers used to know. Um, but designing these systems so they function and managing them effectively is uh, there's a lot of art to that science. Rex, this is Dave. We had a question come in about the use of animals in a vegetable production system. Can you give us any examples of how that might work? Sure. Um, I know uh, there's a farmer close by here that um, once they harvest their their um, kale or vegetables, they'll bring in their sheep to uh, graze the leftovers. So that saves them the labor of you know cleaning up that the leftover crop. It also adds uh, some nutrients. It cycles kind of fertility into those soils as well. Um, so that's the one example in a vegetable system that um, I can think of off the top of my head. But um, I think you could use chickens in a very similar kind of way, and they might go after some of the pupating um, pests in the soil. Although, uh, you know, it's always a trick to manage the chickens in a way that, you know, you can use, use one of those uh, pastured uh cages that can be moved around or you can use an egg mobile and let the chickens kind of scratch in that area and then uh, depending on your situation and uh, kind of your production system and, and if you're raising eggs or meat chickens, you know, those are all considerations. hope that answered that. So, um, moving on, conservation tillage and strip tillage. So I had mentioned um, conservation tillage a while back. The picture on the right shows uh, a roller crimper uh, in action. And what's what's interesting to me in this picture is that the, he's got a roller crimper in front. He's doing a no-till drill in back. So in one fell swoop, this guy is um, he's crimping a cover crop. Uh, taking care of a cover crop, uh, he's got an automatic mulch, he's planting, and uh, he's got this great mulch which will provide some soil protection, uh, habitat for um, crabbed beetles and spiders, and he's doing it in one pass so he's not compacting the soil. You know, this is really kind of an ideal situation. Um, however, there's an investment by the grower, um, not only in knowledge and, and figuring out how this whole system will work, but also in the equipment, the roller crimper itself, the no-till drills, um, figuring out how your particular cover crop reacts to the roller crimper, you know, when is the best time to crimp that crop, what cover crop combinations are amenable to this kind of practice, um, how to set up your um, drill slash transplanter, you know, uh, all the coulters, you know, in the picture on the left, there's all different flavors of these kinds of uh, no-till drills or transplanters. So, you know, how to set that up that fits your operation, those are all um, pretty important considerations. But, you know, if you look at this picture on the right, you know, it's just like, um, it's kind of ecological nirvana in a way. This next slide, it shows a um, picture show the result of a no-till drill that has been modified into a no-till transplanter for processing tomatoes. Now, in this case and in the in the previous slide, uh, it should be noted that the soils in in this situation will generally be cooler than in um, in a regular conventional um, bare ground tilled situation. Uh, one way to alleviate that or to mitigate that would be to have uh, use a wider strip, kind of a, a wider tilled strip in which you're transplanting this into. But on the positive side, um, the young plants are protected against the wind. They're protected against, I've seen uh, young transplants essentially be sandblasted by um, soil that has been picked up by the wind. And uh, so it's protective against uh, soil impacts and, and rainwater impacts that can kind of drown a young plant. So a lot of benefits to this, but there are costs and, and some other things to keep in mind. Rex, the 
there's a question that came in about the comp, uh, do cover crops compete with the cash crop for moisture and nutrients, and how can you minimize that uh, competition? So cover crops competing with the cash crop for moisture and nutrients. Um, depending on how you use the cover crop, uh, cover crops can actually dry out the soil. Um, and, you know, it depends on what part of the country you're, you're doing this in. Um, my brother-in-law farms organically out here, about 400 acres. Um, he put in a cover crop of beans one year, bell beans, great cover crop, huge biomass, but he wasn't able to get in there because it was a wet spring. Um, once he did get in, I mean, he had a huge biomass, but then once you plow down, well, you had to chop it first, and then you have to wait for that cover crop to um, kind of digest. If you plant too early after a cover crop, you may get like seed corn maggots or any of these um, kind of maggots that go after uh, rotting vegetable production. So how do you protect against that? Well, you need to um, chop or you know deal with your cover crop in a timely fashion. Um, and, you know, as far as the soil moisture uh, competition, I think I look at cover crops as an investment. So uh, the organic matter you're putting back into the soil, even though the cover crop may dry out and probably will dry out the soil during the spring, depending on what kind of spring you're having, the organic matter you're putting back into the soil will add to the soil's long-term soil moisture holding capacity as well as its ability to absorb rainfall and, and irrigation water. So I'm not sure I, I totally addressed that question. But um, those are, are some approaches. You know, you just want to separate uh, your crop from your cover crop in time and space, although sometimes you can, um, you know, you can uh, plant right in uh, using some of that no-till technology as well. But um, there's no no simple answers to that. Good question, though. So back to mechanical. Um, I touched on mowing. This machine uh, uses uh, light tillage in just the top couple of inches to manage weeds in the row, so it can be used either in you know vines or or uh, an orchard situation. It uses a, a French plow type of mechanism that will uh, push the the uh, the tines back away from the the base of the tree or the vine. Uh, so you can see after it's gone by on the right picture, kind of what kind of weed management. It's not perfect, uh, as most uh, or most weed management techniques are not perfect, but it does knock down the weeds, and you're not oxidizing and disturbing a huge uh, swath of soil as well. Another approach, not quite mechanical, but flaming is also an option, although I think with increasing energy costs, I think the flaming is be going to become less and less of an option. Um, moving along. So uh, on to insect management, and it looks like uh, we're going to go over here. I hope people can hang on for another 10 or 15 minutes. I apologize for that. Don't worry about the time, Rex. Okay. Um, so, as I have mentioned before, you know, organic farms really rely on their biodiversity to provide the bulk of their insect pest management. One of the basic principles um, of this approach is to uh, help facilitate the biodiversity on the farm by providing habitat and food for the beneficial organisms. And that's not just insects, although um, a lot of this is aimed primarily at insects. So the farm pictured on the left is, is pretty bare bones with respect to habitat for anything. I could just imagine, what if you put a hedgerow down the middle of that field? You know, what an island of biodiversity that would provide. You know, I, and I think about you know you're starving the soil at the same time. Um, the p farm pictured on the right. Uh, they put in a hedgerow specifically to provide habitat to beneficials. As, you know, there's a vetch cover crop there as well. 
But both these pictures were taken um, in late December in the Central Valley. Unfortunately, the picture on the left represents probably more the rule across the United States uh, than the exception. So, and, uh, you know, when you think about any kind of wildlife habitat, bugs, birds, um, snakes, it's, it's a kind of a sad picture. So a lot of the generalist predators that you want to invite in onto your farm, such as the green lacewing, which is pictured on the left, on the, um, on, in the upper part of the picture on the left, uh, the ladybird beetles uh, require nectar and pollen at some stage in their life cycle. Nearly all wasps and bees, as well as some pretty important beneficial fly species, such as surfids and uh, tachinids, which are parasitic, the kind of parasitic flies also require nectar and pollen in order to support their their life cycle. So in the picture at right, and I've circled the the wasp, um, there's a small parasitic wasp that is sizing up some aphids, and what it will do is lay its egg in the aphid, and then um, in an alien type of situation, the the wasp larvae will eat the aphid on the inside out. But wasps like this rely on um, nectar for their energy source. So uh, this picture, on the left there's a tachinid fly, on the right there's a surfid fly. They do need nectar and pollen resources, and so uh, the idea is to provide them in, in some of the habitat you develop on your farm, uh, provide them some nectar and pollen resources, and I'll talk in a little bit more detail about that. I want to talk about surfids a little bit, though, because um, they're found all across the country, but there's different species. They've been um, kind of taken advantage of in California here. Um, a lot of lettuce growers plant this alyssum. That's the white crop. Uh, and they'll, they've developed even a, a an estimate of say 5% of the land, you know, one in every 20 rows, say, is planted to alyssum in some of these lettuce crops because uh, they really want to get the surfid flies out into the crop. The surfid has the advantage of being a good flyer, and it, it disperses its eggs. It doesn't lay eggs in mass. It lays, like, one or two on a plant, and it can, um, in times with high aphid populations, there'll be a, a surfid egg on just about every plant in the field. So um, that's something, you know, you have to figure out what works in your area. These, uh, again, the upper right picture, that's a surfid fly, it's a, they're a wasp mimic. They look a lot like wasps, but they don't sting, and they their behavior actually mimics wasps as well. The lower left is a surfid fly larvae, which is devouring an, an aphid. Um, they, they're just a, a maggot that has a uh, slight coloration to them. So this is a tool that uh, can be developed. Um, this is just for California, but there's uh, similar tools that Michigan State University has developed for the north central and the central region of the country, and that is on the resources um, uh, handout that I provided. But knowing when the flowering periods are of these um, native perennial and uh, bushes and, and forbs, you can design, or the farmer or the NRCS staff can design uh, some habitat that would have flowering resources throughout the growing season or even throughout the year, depending on where you're at. So, um, and these these sources also, these this habitat can provide alternate prey for some of the predators and, and uh, parasites and predators. That's a very important um, concept here, alternate prey as well as alternate um, uh, nectar and flower, nectar and pollen resources. Rex, I had a question come in about the if uh, hedgerows and habitat yes. Is good for beneficials or attracts beneficial? Does it also not attract non-desirable pests? Well, certainly. I mean, as in any uh, situation like this, uh, you're not going to attract just the good guys. Certainly, you'll attract um, some some ligus or you know there there will certainly be pests attracted 
in in those kinds of situations. But um, there's been research uh, done out here in California that uh, it's actually in, uh, well, a fair amount of research, but most recently in California agriculture, October, December 2011, um, Rachel Long did some interesting research showing that if you use native perennials and native annuals uh, to replace uh, what would normally be weeds in an unmanaged area, you'll not only do good things um, for the beneficials because you have a, a, there's more beneficials that are attracted to those kinds of plants than pests are, but then you'll reduce habitat for the pests because pests, uh, there are more pests in unmanaged weedy areas because they're generally invaded by invasive plants that are not native to this country. And uh, apparently the a lot of our um, plant pests are invasives as well, and so they, they go to some of these uh, weedy areas. So the, the idea here is that uh, the native perennials and native annuals even are less likely to host pests than unmanaged weedy areas, and they're much more likely to host beneficials. But of course, you know, you're not always going to have um, a pure stand of beneficials. As a matter of fact, you'll probably never have that. So, um, but this, that's how ecologies work. And there's a lot of different ways to approach uh, this uh, insect management and, and providing biodiversity. Uh, the fellow, the farmer, you know, the picture on the left, uh, this fellow developed his own seed blend, his beneficial seed blend that he plants in the middle row of, of these beds, these lettuce beds, and that provides uh, his own biodiversity in an annual cropping system. And this is a, you know, this guy uses big machinery. I mean, the beds are five rows wide. It's organic, too. Um, on the right, uh, this is a vineyard that uh, uses, it plants every other year a kind of a beneficial cover crop in alternate alleys. And the reason they do this is that in those alleys that the cover crop is planted in, they not only get the beneficial insects coming in, but they can drive the equipment in that, area much earlier in the season uh, than on the non-cropped area or, you know, they'll generally uh, do some light tillage on that other side. Um, and then the next year they'll plant the area they tilled, so they'll rotate their covers. Okay, this is another example. Um, this is in organic cotton. Uh, you the left picture, there's organic cotton, and then moving to the left, there's a couple rows of mustard, a couple rows of sorghum, and a couple rows of sweet corn. Um, this provides habitat for a wide range of beneficial insects as well as birds, and birds are um, often insectivores as well. Um, an added benefit is that it acts as a dust break. If you look on the picture on the right, it acts as a dust break by intercepting the dust that is blown from vehicles going up and down that farm road. And uh, that's important in pest management because uh, dust also uh, exacerbates plants that carry a heavy dust load are much more likely to have spider mite outbreaks. And so if you're growing anything, cotton, peppers, tomatoes, you name it, uh, mites will, can be very easily um, created by a dust outbreak. So, again, um, alfalfa, that grows in many different regions of the country. This is, again, uh, alfalfa strips in organic cotton. Now, alfalfa is an excellent habitat for a lot of beneficial insects, but it is also a very good trap crop for ligus bug. We have ligus out here. I think you have a, something called the tarnished plant bug out on the east, but they're very, very similar in their life cycle and, and their their um, desire to eat alfalfa. The deal with alfalfa, though, is there's six rows. Three rows um, on the right-hand picture, you can see three rows have recently been cut, three rows have been left. 
Ligus bug will prefer alfalfa to cotton, to strawberries, to any other crop as long as the alfalfa is physiologically young. So if you keep alfalfa at a young stage, or at least part of it, um, you'll retain the ligus into that, uh, retain the ligus in the alfalfa as opposed to having it migrate to something that looks a little bit tastier and younger. Most farmers generally have unused land, um, so areas, you know, banks between fields, um, areas around irrigation infrastructure, corners of center pivot fields. And this goes back to that qu uh, most recent question that was asked, you know, um, if you put these in, in annuals or, you know, native annuals or native perennials, and actually alyssum is not a, um, a native, uh, but there are some flowers that I think are beneficial even though they're not native. But if you figure out something that can be done with these areas, instead of having just weeds grow up around there, uh, you can really add some biodiversity. I call these biodiversity islands. And, you know, farmers are pretty creative when it comes to that. If you give them that idea, you know, it, it adds a little beauty and it adds some biodiversity to places that uh, were actually probably providing more pests than beneficials previously. Uh, structural diversity, another principle to keep in mind. Um, it's in, as with spiders, you know, it's important to have plant structural diversity as well as a diverse um, flower structural diversity. Uh, insects come in all kinds of uh, sizes and shapes. Uh, they, the smaller insects, the smaller wasps, the smaller flies, um, they're better able to access some of these uh, very small flowers in the carrot family, the dill family, um, yarrow, California buckwheat, alyssum is a good example of that. Uh, they have shorter tongues, and so the smaller flowers are, are good for them. Uh, now the picture on the right shows the kind of the diverse forms of uh, the, uh, some of the native perennials that are typically planted in the hedgerow out here in California. Um, I'm going to be talking about deer grass. This, this one in the in the right-hand picture, the first plant you see, that's deer grass. It's a native clumping deer grass. Um, the common, commonly found in hedgerows out here, and so it, it's a great way to provide overwintering habitat for beneficials as well. And these are dynamic systems. One year, if you plant one crop next to uh, this habitat, you'll have one thing overwintering. Uh, next year, it may be something very different. Um, this is a good example of that. In the left-hand picture, these are manted egg cases uh, in the middle of this uh, dense clump of deer grass. Um, a couple years prior, in this same location, there were hundreds of ladybird beetles overwintering in this same clump of deer grass. So it's a dynamic system. It's always changing, but um, that's kind of the beauty and the challenge of, of developing these habitats. Um, this is more perennial habitat. This is, um, if you can see it, it's uh, part of a center pivot. What they did is put it, that, that middle strip of grass is a beetle bank. Uh, and then you have uh, strips of flowering forbs kind of on the left and annual flowers on the right. Um, it should be noted, crabbed beetles, which inhabit a lot of these beetle banks, they are not only insect predators, but they are weed seed predators. So this is another example of those, you know, many little hammers, you know, you have these little, what are essentially robots going out there collecting these uh, seeds, it all helps to, you know, all this stuff has an impact cumulatively. That's the way these, these ecological approaches work. On the right-hand side, that right-hand picture it shows uh, native perennial shrubs planted um, on a bank that's a, about a three-foot drop between the field on the left and on the right. That was an unused weedy bank, and it's been put to good use now, and uh, it provides some um, positive ecological benefits. As well, both these areas, by not being disturbed every year, you know, it provides kind of an ecological anchor to the system because these are both annual habitats or annual cropping systems, but these are undisturbed habitats. And so 
if you're a critter that's out in that field, out in the disturbed area, it's like four or five times a year you have a major combination earthquake and hurricane move through your uh, your habitat. So um, these things provide some kind of stable anchor. Speaking of which, um, if you're an organic grower that is adjacent to a conventional grower, your inspector may want you to plant a buffer zone uh, because there may be a risk of contamination from your neighbors, uh, chemical sprays, or even uh, fertilizers coming onto the organic property. And so these habitats, you know, hedgerows, windbreaks, can be very effective buffer zones and, and, and not only protect you from um, neighbors, uh, chemical contamination, but also provide some real ecological benefits to your farm and actually to your neighbor's farm as well. Although I, I found that most conventional growers think they're getting only pests from their organic neighbors, but uh, by far it's it's more they're getting uh, beneficial organisms onto their property. So um, as I've mentioned a few times, here's, here's just a, a listing of things to keep in mind when you're uh, trying to implement some biodiversity and in the background there, you see, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, um, a monarch larvae, there's a chrysalis, there's also some yellow aphids that are feeding on the uh, narrow-leafed milkweed, milkweed, which is a part of a, a hedgerow that is adjacent to some tomatoes. Um, those aphids on there are alternative prey, as well as the monarch is a potential alternative uh prey for parasites, so that's one of the things to keep in mind. Alternative prey can be uh, developed in the hedgerow as well, and that's very important to your beneficial population. A few other little hammer suggestions, and I'm, I'm almost done here, but um, bat species, most of the bat species in the U.S. are insectivores. Uh, there are several species, including this uh, the common name is big brown bat, exist in the U.S. and are uh, quite at home in man-made structures. Uh, this critter will feed on June bugs, green stink bugs, cucumber beetles and, and moths and other things. It's an opportunistic feeder. Uh, it'll often overwinter close to its summering location, and it can establish colonies of up to 600 individuals. These bats are, you know, they're a foot in wingspan. They only weigh about an ounce. However, they can eat every night. They can eat up to half their body weight in insects. And if you have a large colony, that's a lot of bugs. So um, they like man-made structures. Uh, again, my brother-in-law has uh, noticed that there were bats in these uh, the headers and his support beams. He just replicated that, and then they brought in some uh, bat boxes to boot. But um, uh, bat boxes, in California anyways, they do much um, better if they're attached to a building because of the thermal mass of the building. Uh, bats are pretty heat and cold sensitive. Um, so the one on the left receives early morning sun. The one, the bat box on the right uh, is facing north. To be noted, uh, on the East Coast, bats are really under pressure. Uh, this geomyces fungus, this white nose fungus, has, has really created some problems. So this is a um, kind of a win-win situation where you can help the wildlife as well as helping your uh, helping reduce your pest populations by um, providing some habitat. Make sure there's at least a 10-foot drop, though, underneath the bottom part of the bat box if you're doing that. Otherwise, uh, the that box will become a kind of a cat smorgasbord or a skunk smorgasbord because they'll just be waiting there for the the, um, the bats to drop out. And um, just a few more slides to go. Before I finish, I wanted to talk about just a, a resource that um, I helped develop that's uh, what I call the Ecological Pest Management Database. And it's pretty easy to use, um, particularly easy if you read the directions that are, if you scroll down below this um, input part. Uh, you can search by pest, by active ingredient, by trade name. Uh, it can provide some options with respect to soft pesticides or what I call biorationals. Um, 
and notes which pesticides are listed by OMRI, uh, the Organic Materials Review Institute. It also has links to labels, uh, manufacturers' contact information, et cetera. So the way you use this, you know, in the pest type, you select the pest type. I, these are just screenshots. Insect, um, you can select either a common name or a scientific name. Um, I selected aphid. That's a pretty general pest. So what's developed is uh, it, a table is generated. There's materials that, uh, you know, if you if you click on the agronym on the top left and the first um, the first material listed, it's it will take you to another page that describes agronym, what it controls. If you click on as a directin, the active ingredient, um, you will get a listing of all the materials in the in the database that are based on as a directin. And then there's labels, and then on the far right column, it says whether it's Omni listed or not. This before below the Biorationals Ecological Pest Management Database title there you see there's a pest prevention information. If there's information in that field, it will appear, and then if you type on that, you can uh, access some information about aphid prevention. So um, I just wanted to alert you to that resource. It's not perfect. Uh, it's not um, totally comprehensive, but it, it, uh, there's some good information in there. So I covered a lot of territory in that, and um, there, there wasn't time to talk about some of the other things that are kind of near and dear to, to my heart, such as perimeter trap cropping and other things, but I'd be happy to take any questions you have or you can email any questions. So, David, I think that's uh, that about does it for me. Okay, Rex. Uh, appreciate that. And, again, uh, sounds like we need to have you back for uh, Pest Management 2 here in a month or two. So, uh, with that in mind, operator, we, we why don't we try and take a few questions again uh, if you... Uh, if you have a question to call in audibly, uh, I think you hit star one and you'll go through the operator. But while we're waiting, uh, operator, I'm not sure we got questions. I did have one. Somebody wanted to ask ask a question about do you have any uh, way, any experience controlling Johnson grass on organic farms, and uh, or are there any kind of cover crops that you could recommend that might be rolled to prevent Johnson grass? Well, Johnson grass is. You know, it's kind of like Bermuda grass. It's a tough one. Um, if they're willing to incorporate animals, you know, pigs will root up the Johnson grass nodules. You know, they're they're not nodules. They're um, rhizomes or um, corms, I guess. Um, so pigs will really go after Johnson grass. But um, other than that, you know, um, I'm sure sheep will graze Johnson grass. Goats will probably graze Johnson grass. But, you know, that's a literally a, a tough nut to crack because they do have they're they're pretty persistent it's a pretty persistent grass uh it's kind of like the devil weed uh, bermuda grass so it's a tough one to control but i think if you're willing to bring in animals um you might be able to manage that yeah I've also talked to our grazing specialist here in the office with me he says the cows like to eat it too so yeah they like to eat it but you know the the pigs will actually root out yeah. the the corn uh and, and chew on that, so you'll get rid of it, and you'll kind of get some good um, aeration of the soil at the same time. Uh, operator, do we have any call-in questions? No questions at this time. Okay. Well, we got one or two more. I'll let me read off, and then we probably should wrap this thing up and let folks get back to, uh, to their daily business there. Sure. Uh, the question is about the use of the term biorationals. And they want to know if that's included in wind pests. And I'm not sure you know. Yeah, you're probably familiar no, with wind No, I'm familiar with wind pests. Biorationals is, is um, if you go to the website that I showed, that Ecological Pest Management Database, I, I kind of define what I mean by biorationals. But it's, um, well, you'd have to go to the live database because okay. it's on the first page and, and you'd have to scroll down. But um, it's essentially any kind of softer uh, chemicals that are used and, I think wind pest is a great resource for um, conventional, you know, advising conventional growers on the ecological impacts. I think because most organic growers don't use um, pesticides that are too harmful, although there are some, you know, pyrethrum can, you know, it's broad spectrum and, and really knocks down a lot of different critters, but it doesn't last very long. So, um, but biorational is, is a very kind of ambiguous term by denoting uh, more natural and softer chemicals. 
Well, the, and one thing you may want to check out is the Agronomy Tech Note 5 has some good uh, descriptions and activities and practices for, uh, as an outline for integrated pest management that would fit into to a lot of what what Rex is talking about. And let me get one more question in here, and then we'll we'll, we'll close it out. Uh, there's a question came in about uh, insectary flowering charts, and they're wanting to know if there's anything um, available uh, for the other than the Michigan and uh, California area that you mentioned. Well, there's um, there's if you Google kind of flower phenology, I think there are some websites that give you uh, flowering times. But it's kind of listed plant by plant, I think. Um, it's been a, uh, it's only these folks that are doing some of these, um, like those flowering charts, that there's a, um, a trifold from MSU that outlines um, very, it's a very similar kind of uh, product and that one slide I showed that showed the uh, flowering times of the native perennials in California. But um, those are developed from a lot of other information. But there's a lot of information about flower phenology or, or um, native perennial pheno flower flowering phenology that gives you their bloom times, but you'd have to aggregate that into something that a farmer could use. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rex. Well, and thank uh, just a great job, I think. And, again, uh, one last question that came in. I, I think I'm going to take a stab at answering this. This came in early in your presentation. It says that NRCS works by practice standards, and organics work best by uh, best operates by with a systems approach. And I'm wondering if the differences can be bridged. And unfortunately, that's I did not agree with that statement. Uh, we have always worked as a as a systems approach. We've been driven more to a practice standard because of our financial assistance programs. People come in and, and sign up for a particular practice. NRCS conservation planners should never be out there just planning by practice. They should be planning a, a systems approach that incorporates multiple practices to address a resource concern. The bridge can be, uh, uh, it can be bridged, and I think it's just a matter of remembering what our basic planning principles are. We don't plan by practice. We plan to address a resource concern. So with that, I'm going to close it out and remind folks of a few things. I had a question about the handouts. If you look at the top bar on the on your screen, there look right to the right, there's a word feedback. If you go left, two icons, it looks like there's three stacks of papers. If you mouse over that, it should say handouts. You click on that, and all you have to do is uh, Click on the empty box there and hit upload, and those will go right to your computer. That's where you get the handouts that Rex provided, along with your documentation uh, for uh, certified crop advisor uh, credits. Um, the next thing I'd like to cover is the replay will be available for NRCS employees off of the Science and Technology uh, Training Library, and it'll be accessed by next week. And the public can get to it off of the NRCS, or the East National Technology uh, Center's uh, website. We, we make them available to the public, so you get two accesses there. And then the last thing I'll say, I put a plug in for our next webinar after the holiday season is over, the end of January. Kale Gullett, our fishery biologist, will be talking about stream habitat management. Uh, and assessing stream conditions, and if you've never heard one of uh, Kale's presentation, he's very thorough and informative on this, this very uh, particular topic. And then the last thing is we plan on hosting a series of six organic, organic webinars starting in February. I might be able to bribe Rex to come back and do something on this. We haven't necessarily nailed down the topics, but we're going to start in February, and they do it every other month throughout the rest of the calendar year. So with that in mind, Rex, I want to say thanks again. Uh, we had a great participation, and uh, I, I just think you could have kept talking there for a lot longer. And, uh, again, we appreciate everybody participating, and hope you have a good rest of the day. Okay. Thanks a lot, David. Okay, Rex. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for participating in today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.